Okay, Thank sure. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so now that you know who I am, <laughs> I'll get started here. Um, I have a, several pests that I want to talk about today and issues, um, and some of these I'll go through more quickly than others. Um, but because there's so many, I broke them down into kind of three different categories. Um, some that are already here and causing damage. And some of these have been around for a while. Um, not all of them are newer, um, but we think that people should know about them because we, we are seeing them often or we find that people don't seem to, aren't familiar with them um, or, or we think you should be aware of them. Um, the next group is pests that are affecting greenhouse and nursery operations. So it's not just affecting one plant that um, damaging that one type of plant. Um, it's something where um, nurseries or greenhouses may need to change operational systems to deal with that pest. Um, and then there are some that are not here in Maine and we want you to be on the lookout for. And then also we want you to be on the lookout for invasive plant rule changes that are coming up as well. So. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with this first group, um, and in this group, there are several that, like I mentioned, have been here for a while, um, but there are several that do damage to the buds, uh, the flower buds of very common perennials. So let's start with those, um, and this first one is sunflower moth caterpillar, or sometimes it's called sunflower seed moth caterpillar. And this is one that um, actually it was a, man, a, a perennial manager at a nursery that asked me about it. And he asked about um, a echinacea borer and I had never heard of that or seen it before. So, um, and at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of information about echinacea borer out there, but we determined that it's actually the sunflower moth caterpillar. Um, and so this affects plants in the aster family, not just echinacea, but echinacea is what we see it on the most out in nursery inspections. I've also seen it on Rudbeckia and Heliopsis, but it can be on Cosmos, Marigolds, Coreopsis, several different things, sunflowers. Um, and what it does is the adult moth lays its eggs on um, the flower buds and those hatch and the larva um, which are caterpillars because this is a moth, the caterpillars kind of feed on the pollen and the tips of the florets and then as they get bigger they um, bore down into the flower bud and so they leave this black frass so you can see in the lower picture here it looks pretty dirty on that flower head um, and then the picture above you can see that um, larva inside um, really eating the whole flower bud from the inside out. Um, the smaller caterpillars are, are um, a pale yellow and like I said they feed on the outside so you may be able to pick those off but um, or you could spray B BT if you can get to it at those early in stars. As it gets bigger and it goes down into the flower it turns more of a purple brown and has white longitudinal stripes um, generally, if you're seeing this black frass on the outside of the flowers and there's petals missing and you open that up, you're probably going to find um, the caterpillars inside. And there are multiple generations um, per year, um, or there can be, but I, this is actually a moth that migrates. And this is something, new information that I've gotten recently from North Carolina Extension. Um, the moths actually overwinter in northern Mexico and then they blow up on breezes or they just migrate every year. Um, and so they don't get here until probably late July um, we start seeing the damage or they can come on nursery stock. So if, so if there's a grower who's further south they may get it sooner and then it gets delivered up here. But this is a picture of the actual moths. They're not very descript, <laughs> like it, it, that's not probably what you're gonna see here. But um, the picture on the right here is actually, I believe that's the Heliopsis that I saw it on, um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like on a different crop. But you know, Echinacea is such a, and, and Aster family plants are so commonly sold in the state. We really think everybody should be aware of this one. Um, yeah, so that's all I had on that. The next one that also um, is a problem on flower buds is iris budfly. 
And this one's been around for a few decades anyway. Um, so it's been here for a while, but not everybody knows about it yet. And they may just find that their flowers are kind of being destroyed and not opening fully. Um, so and it's not something you can see very easily. So this one is actually a fly and the larva of flies are called maggots, which I think we all have heard of maggots, but um, so that's the larva that is boring into this one. And so the egg is laid on the outside of the flower bud and they bore into the base and they go in and they eat the pollen and then they destroy the standards and styles. And depending on how long they're in there, they can really destroy the whole flower bud. Um, and, and for people who are growing these or hybridizing um, irises, uh, it's a real problem because they're destroying the, the pollen before and the flower structure from the inside. Um, let's see. So these are just more pictures of the damage it does. It may just be a little bit of damage, but then it can destroy a whole flower as well. And so what they do is they may drop and, and go to another flower bud once they're finished with one, but they, when they're old enough, they will actually tunnel down into the stem of the flower, of the, the flower. And um, that's where they'll eventually pupate for winter um, and overwinter in the stem. So if you can catch this early enough and keep an eye on those flower buds and you can look for the holes in the side of the flower bud and pull them off. Um, and if you can catch it before it goes down into the stem, you can kill that insect as well. We always say don't throw things like this in the compost pile because that is just, it can overwinter there as well and, um, and continue to spread that way. So always, if you're destroying something because there's a pest, make sure you're bagging it and throwing it in the trash or burning it or soaking it in soapy water um, and use good ways to, to um, dispose of it instead of um, making it a problem somewhere else. Uh, so ways you can control this are a good fall cleanup because it's overwintering in those stems. If you're cutting the plants back in the fall, um, you should hopefully be cleaning that up. But again, make sure you're not putting it in your compost pile. And I wanted to say that these seem to prefer Siberian irises, but they can um, affect um, most varieties or species of iris. So um, it's not just Siberian iris. Um, I read an article recently that talked about using yellow sticky cards for um, control of this insect and the way they were doing that, usually we say sticky cards to use for just monitoring, um, but they were actually putting out a lot of sticky cards around their irises and that not only did they know when the adults were flying in the spring or early summer, but they they were actually catching a lot as well. So they were gonna do some more studies on different colors of sticky cards. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a real great long-term strategy, but it might reduce the population a little bit and catch them before they lay eggs. Um, it is, um, you can use systemic sprays, but the thing is these are flowers and most people don't like to use those. They're toxic. They can be toxic to bees and other pollinators. So something you have to consider. Um, as I mentioned, you can re remove and destroy any damaged flower heads, hopefully before the larva moves to a different one. Um, so those are some controls that you could do if you do find this, which we are seeing quite often in nursery inspections now. Another one that does a similar type of damage is daylily gall midge. And these are on daylilies. So these are all really common crops and important perennials. Um, this was this has been reported in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia, but there really weren't any reports on the East Coast or throughout most of the country. And um, a couple of years ago, we had a homeowner in Waterville report this. Um, and they had done some research and actually thought that they had daylily gall midge. So we did send someone out and we were able to confirm that it was daylily gall midge that they had in their yard. And the only thing is it couldn't be officially confirmed by USDA because they needed an adult male um, and it's kind of hard to catch a midge. Um, so we haven't seen it in 
nurseries or greenhouses, but we we know that it was at this homeowner site. So it definitely could be here. And we also don't know if this is around um, kind of not just here in Maine, but in other states as well, um, and just hasn't really been reported or recorded very much. So we're kind of keeping an eye out for this and we're hoping other people will as well. Um, again, this is a, a midge, so it's a type of fly and has a maggot larva and it eats the inside of the daylily flowers. Um, so it makes them, when they open, they are deformed and not pretty, which is what people want when they're buying plants. So another one to keep an eye out for. And, you know, with daylilies, most people think they're so tough and they don't have many pests, but it seems like they're getting some more things that are affecting them right now. Um, Daylily leaf miner has been around for several years. In fact, the first official, well, unofficial report was from Maine in Kennebunk in 2006, and that was the first report in the U.S. that was posted on an Insect ID website that um, we don't know who made that report, so we were never able to follow up with it. But now we are seeing this um, often and at many different nurseries. So it's become common here. And when one when a nursery has it one year, it seems to be even a little bit worse the next year. Um, so it's definitely overwintering and um, is a problem on daylilies. But it's not killing the plants. It's just kind of making them unsightly. And here's what it does. So the adults will lay an egg just under the leaf surface, kind of towards the tip of the leaves. And then the larva will go in, you know, between the two different layers, um, the upper and lower surface of the leaf. And it chews, it's a leaf miner, so it's mining down through that. And it slowly makes its way to the bottom of the leaf. And generally that trail will get larger as the, as the larva is growing. Um, and again, this is a little maggot. Um, and then it will pupate kind of at the base of the leaf. And that's when it is the generation that's going to overwinter because um, there can be several generations in a year. Um, it will pupate at the base of the leaf. So again, a good fall cleanup um, where you're actually um, destroying or burning the or bagging up the foliage is really recommended if you're having a problem with this at your site. Um, let's see. I think that's all I had for that one. So the next one um, we, you may have heard us talk about before. This would be more of a concern for fruit and vegetable growers. So tomatoes and peppers especially. Um, and, and more so for um, greenhouses that are producing these for the fruit, for the actual produce, and not so much maybe for seedlings, but we're still keeping an eye out for it. Um, and it's a concern for even on a national level because this is a food crop and um, any <laughs> damage to a major food crop is, is a concern. Um, but this is a virus, tomato brown or ghost fruit virus, and viruses can't be cured once a plant gets them. Um, there's nothing you can do other than dispose of the plant. So um, that's a concern and it causes a lot of different um, symptoms, but they're all very similar to some other virus symptoms. Um, so it's hard to determine if you did have some of these, whether it's actually this virus or, or maybe to, tomato, um, tobacco mosaic or other things. Um, so it would probably have to be tested in a lab, but we, would want to know if you're seeing having problems like this. So mottled foliage um, that's deformed in tomatoes, they say that the leaves look kind of fern-like because not all the edges of the leaf are growing at the same rate. So they're deformed and kind of twisted. As you can see, the fruit just does not look right and obviously isn't saleable. Um, we weren't overly concerned with fruit being a, a way that, you know, if somebody buys an infected fruit, to eat doesn't seem like that would be a concern, but if they don't, if it that if they throw that in the compost pile and there's seeds in there, that can potentially be an issue. So we haven't seen this in any greenhouses or nurseries um, that are selling plants, but we have it has been at a greenhouse that produces tomatoes in the state of Maine. Um, so it has been here 
Um, it's highly transmittable. So, you know, viruses can spread by plant sap, you know, if you're pinching or using tools and then going from plant to plant, it can spread that way. Um, but it also can move in different ways on plant, propagative plant material. So it can be on seedlings or cuttings or grafts, and it can also be transmitted by seed. So just because you're getting seeds doesn't mean you're necessarily um, immune from this virus. So just another one to keep an eye out for. Now I would... I'm hoping, you know, when we're in person, I like doing these types of slides and make people guess what, what they're seeing here. Um, so if anybody wants to unmute and pipe up and give um, an opinion of what they think is going on with these pepper plants, that would be great. And if not, that's okay too. Okay, so um, these are pepper plants at a greenhouse, kind of late in the season, um, probably considering getting rid of them soon, but they just do not look right. Um, there's deformed leaves, um, yellowing. You can see some of them look kind of um, spotty, um, curled upper leaves. So I contacted Allison Smart at the diagnostic lab about this one. I thought it might be a virus um, and she ended up taking a look at it, or maybe something cultural, maybe fertilizer or um, something is deficient. But what she found under the microscope were broad mites. Um, and these aren't a mite that you can see with the naked eye, you know, like you can, or some people can with um, two spotted spider mites, but these are microscopic. So um, it wasn't actually on my radar as being broad mites when I was looking at these because I've never seen them on vegetable crops before. But I think it's important to remember when you're seeing something deformed like this, it's just another, another pest to keep in mind. Um, and we have seen broad mites in the last few years on Thunbergia as well. So um, they, yeah, and like I said, you can't see it unless you're looking under a microscope. So. Um, if you see something weird like this, don't let it get this far. Please let us know <laughs> or send a sample to the Humane Diagnostic Lab first. This was a lot of peppers that were infected and it seemed to be more the sweet peppers than the hot peppers, but hot peppers have some weird foliage anyway sometimes. Um, so it, maybe it just wasn't showing symptoms as much, but um, I thought that was an interesting case that people should be aware of. And this one, um, you may have seen um, me talk about in the past. Um, this is a rust that was found on aloe plants at a year round greenhouse um, here in the state. It was, I found it, um, I think it was December of 2019. So it was a couple of years ago, um, but it wasn't anything I had ever seen before. Um, it was very obviously a rust because there were pustules on it and they were in kind of concentric rings. Um, these were really like easy to see. And just the fact that the tissue is turning yellow around those because the fungus is pulling the nutrients from the plant tissue um, really shows that something's going on that is, um, you know, living a biotic problem. And when I, you know, rub that on a piece of white paper, it left a rust colored smear of the spores. Those were actually open. So the, the greenhouse, some of the staff thought that they had just gotten too dry and they had just gotten some little calluses on them. Um, again, this is one, it, it's a weird thing and we would hope and we, we want to encourage people to let us know when they see an oddity like this. Um, this is not something that's, um, there was one report of this in California at one point, but that was it. Like, we don't know if this is something that's out there and people just, don't see it very often or um, it's just, it, we don't have any real reports of it. So um, Allison Smart at the Cooperative Extension did identify it down to it being either a Puccinia or a Euromyces rust, um, but we would have needed molecular testing if we wanted to know exactly what it was. Um, I've never seen this anywhere else and I hope I don't, but if anybody, it's a pretty obvious thing to see so if you have this 
ever if this ever shows up on your um, aloe plants, please let us know. Okay, so it looks like we finished that first category. And I'm thinking maybe we should do our first poll question. So I'm gonna launch that. If anyone has questions on the poll, if they can't access it for their pesticide credits, let me know. And anyone that's not going for pesticide credits, feel free to answer, but it's uh, not required. It should pop up for you. Right, has everybody answered? I don't know how many people we have on the call, but. 11 including us. Okay, so we should be good. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the question was the best, it's a true or false, the best place to dispose of disease or pest infested plant material is a compost pile, which everybody knows is false. <laughs> the, the pest or disease can spread from your compost pile, so you're not eliminating it if you put it there. Good job. End poll. Okay. So um, moving on to the next category, um, I am going to talk about um, some things, some pests that are causing operational changes or shifts in the way people are doing things at greenhouses and nurseries. So um, let's start in with the invasive stilt grass. And this is one of the plants that's on our um, invasive do not sell list, the invasive plant list. And it's not because it's actually sold. Nobody's selling stilt grass at their greenhouse or nursery, but it can be a hitchhiker and is known to hitchhike on nursery stock. So um, we don't have a whole lot of these on the, on the invasive plant list right now. I think there's three um, that are just kind of there because they're hitchhikers. But this one is concerning um, because it can spread into forested areas. So it can um, grow in shaded spots. Um, it also kind of crowds out other native plants and forms a thick kind of thatch layer because the, the stems kind of fall to the ground and stay there. And every year it kind of adds on to that. And that can be a fire hazard actually, and can be a problem with fires. So something we are concerned about and this has been now found in Maine. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a nursery in York County um, that found it. And I, we think it had been there maybe five years or so, um, but they had moved some landscape fabric and disturbed the soil and maybe brought light to the soil that had some seeds on it. And it kind of took off from there. So it became obvious. And, you know, we went down and helped pull all of as many of those plants as we could, um, but it, it did move on nursery stock. I do think it came in on some perennials. So um, be on the lookout for dense patches of unfamiliar grass that could be stilt grass. And some of the key identification um, characteristics are um, the leaves are alternate and they are about two, and a, two to four inches long and a half an inch wide. And they have a very distinct stripe of reflective hairs along the midrib, um, which you can kind of see in this photo. And, and the other thing is some of our native grasses, when you run the grass blade between your fingers, kind of catches on your skin, like they're rough. This is very smooth. It doesn't catch on your hand. So that's a good ID trick too. Um, so, um, we want, this just kind of gets people into thinking about weeds as a whole. And I think over the next several years, you're gonna hear us talking more about our concerns with weeds at nurseries and greenhouses. Um, because in the past, I think a lot of people have thought, well, nobody wants weeds, but you know, it's just something that's around. And you know, this these weeds are in everybody's yards, right? Well, no, not necessarily. And so 
We think there needs to be a change in how people are thinking about weeds at nurseries and greenhouses. And even um, we are seeing, and, and it's probably been there for a long time, about invasive plants that are growing around nurseries and greenhouses, um, around the property, maybe not like right in the sales area, but you know, if you have bittersweet growing or multiflora rose growing in the perimeter, it's very easily could drop seeds into the pots or root balls of plants that you have for sale. So then that could move that to another place. So we're really kind of gonna try to be talking to people about the risks with having weeds and pots. And, and that's gonna become more of a operational change we hope for businesses. But we do hope that if you see something you think is stilt grass, you kind of look it up and, and double check yourself online and then contact us if you think it's, you still think it's stilt grass. Um, you can report it to imapinvasives.org or, or send it to the invasives.mnap at main.gov. Um, we don't want this spreading around to forested areas um, and we're really trying to keep it, those places we found it, we're trying to eradicate. And I just want to mention that at one of the sites in Georgetown where this was found um, growing on private property, um, we went and did a day of control and, and took a, and made a video giving more information on it. So I think it's only six minutes. It's quick, but gives a lot of information on stilt grass so you know, really know what to look for in the future. So we, if you go to YouTube and type in invasive stilt grass in Maine, that should pop right up. All right, so the next group of, the next pest I want to talk about is the amenthus worms, which, you know, everybody's been talking about crazy worms, jumping worms, snake worms, Alabama jumper, um, and I'm sure you've heard about it several times, or I hope you have, maybe not, um, but this has, you know, it's been since 2012, 2014 that we knew about some um, established populations in the state of these worms. And um, again, we're kind of thinking about how these affect greenhouses and nurseries um, because they are around now and they are being, we are finding them at greenhouses and nurseries. Um, so if you don't know this worm or haven't heard anything about it, um, this is one that uh, I'll just give you a few identification characteristics. Um, they're a little darker in color um, and have this milky white clitellum that is smooth. So it doesn't have ridges in the clitellum and it goes all the whole way around um, the worm. Some don't go the whole way around. But when you pick these up or disturb them, they thrash and go crazy in your hand and they even can drop their tail. Uh, that's happened to me before when I picked one up. Um, so they're a little more crazy than some of the other worms out there, and they tend to really be in the um, organic layer of the soil, kind of towards the surface. Um, so I don't want to go into too much um, background information about these because I imagine you've heard about it, but earthworms really can eat up all the organic matter out of a forest or undisturbed area and, and leave the soil compact. And it might be a flush of nutrients, but then in the long term, there aren't any, you know, that organic matter is not there anymore. And um, so some of the native plants that are really um, necessary in those wooded areas um, may not be able to live there anymore. So there's a lot of ecological impacts. Um, with earthworms and especially these crazy worms seem to be especially voracious and eat a lot. So I want to point out that we people have been finding them in pots in at nurseries and they tend to leave the soil, they, they go through and they eat all the organic matter out of that pot and leave the soil kind of like coffee grounds and very packed and dry. Um, and so it doesn't hold water the same way. Um, and a, a single worm, because these worms are, can reproduce on their own without a mate, a single worm or a single egg, which the eggs are in little cocoons that have a few different eggs in them, um, can start a whole new population somewhere else. 
So moving plant pots can possibly move um, crazy worms. And I, I've always liked this picture. We've been using it for a while um, because it gets you to think this is a tub of soil that it looks like has been infested with crazy worms, but there is a cocoon in here um, and there it is, but you never would have seen it. Uh, it's not like you can go through the soil and pick out the crazy worms. It, it just would never happen. So um, we do have to be concerned about this in the horticulture industry because it is moving around, whether it's, you know, landscapers picking up, you know, raking and picking up leaves and some of that topsoil, the organic matter from the top of the soil while they're doing that, um, that can pick up crazy worms and then they go bring it to maybe a municipal landfill, which they have been found in some of those, you know, the compost at um, municipal sites. Um, they can move with plant material that's potted or, you know, people who are doing their own little sales and swaps with friends could be moving it to um, somebody else's house. Uh, the other thing is that they can, oh, I'll go, uh, I'm gonna switch directions a little bit, but so we are working on um, best management practices for these. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a working group that's um, started that a little in a minute, but um, we just, some of the best management practices that you can do now um, are just watch for them, watch for the signs of them, make sure, you know, you're using clean soil um, or potting media. Educate yourself so you know how to recognize them um, and use, sell, plant, purchase, or trade landscape and gardening materials that are, appear to be free of jumping worms. You know, you have to kind of be a little more aware than in the past that if that open that kind of ripped bag of soil that's been on the ground since last year um, before you just start to use it, you should probably look through it a little bit um, just to be sure. Um, and you might want to start thinking about storing those a little bit, <laughs> a little more securely so that they're not um, picking up crazy worms anywhere. So um, there is now a working group here in the state that's trying to come up with some solutions to the issues with crazy worms. Um, and so this is, I know, Cooperative Extension and some ag folks, and there's a, a variety of people who are working in this, um, but their, their goals are really to develop a better process for reporting crazy worms. Right now, Gary Fish has been getting a bazillion calls about them, and um, that's great. But we've created a survey monkey um, survey. If you basically, it makes it so that if you want to report those, it's an easier way for us to collect that information. Um, we're also developing a standardized method for surveying and monitoring because um, with research, you kind of have to have something standardized that where you're doing the same thing in each place. Um, establish how widespread they've become and if they are in any forested areas, which we know they are in some, but we're not sure, you know, is it everywhere in Maine? Or, you know, some reports have said that they don't really like acidic soils. And we know with the pine trees in Maine, we have a lot of acidic soils. So we're kind of, we want to get a grasp on how, how much they've spread. Um, and we want to develop better best management practices for especially for nurseries and landscapers, municipal composters, mulch and soil distributors. And we are hoping that UMaine will join in with this larger group of people. I mean, these have become a big issue and, and people are really talking about these. Um, so there's a group that has the um, University of Vermont, UMass and Cornell in New York um, that are already working on this. So we're hoping that we're gonna kind of join up with them um, and they really want to find more management methods, such as a worm aside, <laughs> so to speak, um, that people may be able to use with worms. Because right now there really isn't anything that wouldn't kill beneficial things in the soil as well. 
So um, this slide got a little out of place, I apologize, but some best management practices for soil amendments, um, because this can move in mulch and compost and other soil amendments, um, is to only sell, purchase, or trade compost that was heated to um, appropriate temperatures. So you, you really have to know how your amendments are being produced. Um, make sure that you're arriving to new sites clean so you don't have a bunch of mud on your on your your tires because if there's a little cocoon in that mud it could spread a, a population um, and that includes equipment and personal gear um, and make sure you know there, there needs to be thought going into any kind of soil or mulch or compost and know where it's coming from I think it's good to have um, a relationship with the people who are producing your soil amendments and to know what they're doing to be aware of this and try to avoid crazy worms from being in your soil amendments arriving at your site. So we have a few places you can report crazy worms. I, I told you about that survey, which is new. Um, you can also use the IMAP Invasives website or, um, yeah, and there's the Survey Monkey link as well. So a few different places. So if you do find them, don't panic. Just don't move those plants from the infested areas to new spots. Um, destroy any of the jumping worms that you can find. Um, soapy water is pretty easy to use. Um, they kind of dissolve and, <laughs> and turn really gross. But um, if you're trying to find out if you have them in your soil, you can use a solution of mustard and water and dump that on the soil and it'll kind of bring them to the surface. Um, other chemicals are just not necessarily gonna work on these um, and, and they can kill a lot of other things. So we're really not, until we have something more concretely um, specified to worms um, and using products that are, are not labeled for a certain use, you just really don't want to do that. But they do have some research out that's showing that if you place um, like plastic down and then in a garden bed and then add soil that may be infested with crazy worms and then cover it in plastic and let it get up over 104 degrees, it can, it can kill cocoons. So, and they're finding good success with that. Um, so something that they'll be exploring. All right, that's it for crazy worms. I, we're going to move on to brown tail moth, which I think everybody has probably heard about already. Um, we talk a lot about it in the sense that it's a public health concern. Of course it is, and of course that is the main topic. Um, but in that, we also want to make sure that we're not moving populations of brown tail moth to new areas on nursery stock. And so it's not a it's not a focus we've had in the past, but um, this past year um, in July, there was a huge mass flight of adult um, brown tail moths. And people in, especially in like Auburn, Augusta, Bangor, kind of central Maine areas. And I think that coastal Maine probably already had some of this, like the mid coast area when the populations were higher down there. but you know, people who had outdoor lights like this, or even like gas stations, were just covered in brown tail moth adults. And the adults aren't the ones that have the hairs that irritate your skin. But the adults, so it's usually the males that are attracted to lights, and they're not the ones laying eggs, but the females tend to land on the plant material around the lights, and then they mate and lay their eggs there. So we were finding that the lights were bringing egg masses to nursery stock at, at um, greenhouse and nursery facilities, especially some of the bigger box stores and places in more urban areas. So one thing you can do is use a hose or a pressure washer to wash all these off um, and then vacuum them up with a shop vac that has a filter on it just in case there are hairs around from the caterpillars earlier in the season, that's best to do. Um, but I think it's really important to train your staff to know all life stages of brown tail moth. Because 
um, you want to make sure you're not moving them on nursery stock. And I'll show you some pictures. The egg masses look very much like the tail of the brown tail moth, but they're not very obvious and people may not even know that they could be bringing that home. Um, so yeah, the adults are kind of hatch in July and August. So that's kind of where I'm, what I'm talking about right now. Um, it was just after Independence Day this past year that, that it really exploded. So we say, um, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little kind of in the upper middle part of the screen, there's a, a white moth and it has a little brown tail that it was laying an egg right there on that rose. Um, and so we, we recommend that businesses that have outdoor lights and, and know that the brown tail moths are being attracted to them to do daily inspections of the plant material and just remove any, you know, bring a little bucket of soapy water and toss them in. Um, I will say while the adults aren't spreading the hairs and the egg masses aren't the ones with the hairs that um, make you get a rash, there still can be hairs around in that area um, from earlier on. And in fact, the day that I went out and looked at these, I ended up with a rash that afternoon on my arms, um, even though there weren't any caterpillars right around. They had been around and left their hairs. So we really are asking people to know what the egg masses look like and inspect plants at that time of year um, as, as it's leaving, kind of do a quick look uh, as somebody's purchasing the plant material, um, especially fruit trees, deciduous trees, roses, and other plants that you know are right out there where um, the adults have been landing. So here are a few other pictures that I took um, when, I, when I was looking at these in July. Um, they were laying eggs on everything. But, I mean, this one of these pictures shows it on a, a, a stilby flower. <laughs> um, but this is what the egg masses look like. Um, they're just kind of little brown fuzzy um, spots. So if you can remove those, that's best. All right, let's see. So are there any questions about those topics that I just covered? No, okay, I'm just gonna keep going then. See how I'm doing for time. All right, I'll try to be quick. So there's four other um, things that I wanted to talk about. And these are things that are not here in the state yet, so to speak, um, pepper moth, box tree moth, spotted lantern fly, and the invasive plant rule changes I mentioned. Um, European pepper moth is one that is just kind of getting on people's radar and it was found in Maryland this past year, but um, it's been around in, the, in other parts of the country um, for a little while. They first found it in California and they kind of eradicated that and then um, it was found again in California and now it's found in like 15 states more south of here. I don't think it would ever actually overwinter here, but it does have a wide host range. And so this chart shows you all the different things that it can be found on. Um, there's a lot of plants there and a lot of really common ones. And this picture on the right shows an adult male, the moth. Um, and there's a few arrows on there. So the white arrow is pointing to this dip in a white line on the wings, and that's pretty characteristic of this moth. Now moths, so many of them look a lot alike, so it's hard to tell, but if you're really trying, <laughs> these are things to look for. Um, also the males have one of their stripes on their abdomen goes the whole way around. That's what the red arrow is showing. And the males also have a longer abdomen that they kind of curl under when um, they're at rest. So it's longer than the females. So here is um, a picture of the larva on the right here. Um, and this is a moth, so the larva is a caterpillar. And it's the larva that does the damage, which is usually the case with these types of insects. Um, the larva actually eat um, all different parts of the plant. And I have another picture on my next slide that'll show more of that. But 
Here you can see the larvae is kind of in the soil. They tend to be more, um, they, they like to be down in that humid conditions on the soil surface. So they might be eating plant material that's down there. They can eat the roots of the plants, um, stems. So it's definitely a concern with all those different plants that they can be on. And on the left here, you can just, you see the male is on the left, uh, the adult male, see how the abdomen's longer, and then the adult female, the eggs, and then the larva and the pupa, it pupates kind of in that soil surface and it really hides under there. Um, it can be um, kind of wrapped in soil and attached underneath one of the lower leaves on a plant. And here you see some of the damage that it does. So when the larvae are smaller, they tend to eat the leaves and kind of the more delicate um, things that they can chew through. And then as they get older, they can really chew on the stem. They can chew, bore into the stem and kind of be a borer. Um, they can eat fruit, uh, roots, like I mentioned, leaves. So basically all parts of the plant. When they're chewing on the stem, they sometimes girdle the plant by chewing all the way around that stem. So that's a real concern. Um, again, we haven't found this in Maine and it's very unlikely that it could ever overwinter here unless it was inside of a heated year round greenhouse. Um, and we think that it's not really being found in the field. As far as we know, it's more in very specific humid conditions kind of they like that soil surface, um, lower plant area. Um, so we always say to inspect incoming plant material for webbing or chewing on the leaves. Um, you can remove those lower leaves and keep the soil on the dry side to get rid of that moist, humid condition that they like, um, habitat that they like. Um, BT will work on some of the smaller instars. If you can get it when they're small and they are kind of on the undersides of the leaves, so good contact will be in, important there. Um, there's a bunch of biological controls that could work on these. Um, so there are some other options if they do become a problem here. Um, so it's just one that you want to start looking for if you're finding chewing on some plants that you might not expect it on. You know, if your geraniums are being chewed up inside the greenhouse and you might want to figure out what's going on with that. Okay, this is another one um, that is newer. Um, it's we haven't found here in the state, but the um, it's been a concern on a national level, and USDA kind of got involved with this one. Um, box tree moth is actually let me get my little card here. Um, native to Asia and was found in Europe in 2007 where it's been moving like three to six miles a year naturally spreading. Um, it was found in Toronto in 2018 and then last year in 2021 there were actually shipments that were made from the Toronto area to the United States and they were shipped, um, these are box boxwood plants were shipped, they were infested and they were kind of mixed in with other boxwoods at a at a national distributor. So um, infested plants or potentially infested plants kind of went all over the place and we did a trace forward on these. Um, we did have someone in the state of Maine who a homeowner bought three little eight inch boxwood plants and um, I went out and inspected the site and didn't find anything. So we did collect those plants and destroy them even though they looked clean but just to be on the safe side. USDA wanted those to be destroyed. So yeah, this infects box, infests boxwood plants as well as um, uh, some other hosts are just um, burning bush. So Euonymus alatus, it can eat that all at once, except we don't want it here anyway. So, <laughs> but um, also Euonymus, the other one, sorry, I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget. Euonymus japonicus which is Japanese spindle tree, which is another type of euonymus. And there is a type of holly, um, purple holly, Ilex chinensis, is another host for this pest. Um, here you see the adults, and there's a couple different color variations. Um, both male and female uh, moths can have these either of these colors. Um, 
they are a little iridescent and they have these little kind of comma shaped markings or crescent moons on their forewings. And this is a type of moth that's called a snout nose moth because it kind of protrudes. Um, so that's what the adult would look like. And then here you can see in the upper left, those are eggs, which <laughs> boxwood leaves are so small that those eggs would be very hard to find and, and see. And these caterpillars really hide very well in the foliage too. So um, kind of translucent eggs hatch into these larvae that feed on the foliage. And they also can feed on the stem as well if the population's high enough or if they run out of foliage to eat and that can girdle the stem. Um, the structure you're seeing below the caterpillars is called something, it's really cool. It's called a hibernarium, which <laughs> it's like a little cocoon that's made for overwintering um, and the larva overwinter in that. Um, I kind of wish I could have my own little hibernarium here at my house, but um, then they pupate and the pupa on the lower left-hand side here, as you can see, look very similar to the leaves of boxwood. So um, they can be really hard to detect. Um, and we don't, like I said, we don't really know that of any here in Maine, but we are definitely on the lookout. Um, boxwood seem to be getting more pests lately. But this is kind of a really, this is the damage that you'd see on a very highly infested plant. Um, they, they leave this webbing um, behind, which also makes it hard to control them as well, uh, because it, it makes it so any kind of spray may not go down as far into there to kill the plant, the, the caterpillars. So you could try handpicking caterpillars if you had a a problem with these, a strong spray of water might wash them off the leaves. Um, they're working to see if some pheromones might be able to be used. Um, there are some natural enemies in the native range of this insect, but they have a very large um, host range of other things, other insects they could potentially um, cause damage to, which we don't really want. So we probably, they're gonna have to do a lot more work on natural enemies. Um, but horticultural oil, insecticidal soaps could work on this. BT, if you're getting it, you're really getting good contact on the undersides of those leaves um, where the larvae are feeding. Spinosad might be another option as well. So those are some controls. I know I'm running out of time here. So um, I think, I imagine most of you have heard of spotted lanternfly, um, but I'm not going to go into this very much because um, I don't, want to waste <laughs> the time on it, but um, spotted lanternfly is a pest that has not been officially found here in Maine, um, living here anyway, um, And but it is widespread. It started in Pennsylvania back in 2014. It spread here to the United States then and has moved throughout the country. Um, they feed on a lot of different plants. They suck the sap out of them and they kind of have become a nuisance because that sap runs all over the place and there's sooty mold and um, where there's high infestations there, people are really having these be a nuisance. They have to sweep them off their front porch every day. Um, here's a map of kind of where it's spread now. There is a population in Massachusetts that's probably the closest one for us. Um, so it's not very far away and these are known to hitchhike they spread by their egg masses, um, which are laid on any smooth surface. So it could be pellets or rocks or pottery, vehicles. Um, so those egg masses could be transported really easily on nursery stock. And we have had a few, I just wanted to update you on how this is actually impacting us here in Maine. Um, we have had a few cases where shipments of trees have come in with egg masses on them, but we believe those egg masses were old and had hatched before they got here. My cat's coming to say hello. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so we are keeping an eye on this, but we want to be clear that it's not just trees that they could get here on. Um, they do feed on other plants as well, and these pictures are not great, but these are ones I took of poinsettias 
that um, had come in with dead spotted lanternfly adults in the pots. Um, I think they were on the bottom of, they, they were all kind of just laying on the soil surface and they really kind of looked similar to those dead leaves at the soil surface. So luckily these were all dead and these plants had been treated with a systemic, so it killed them when they fed on those stems. But um, they are getting into greenhouses down south um, where they're more prolific. And so it's, we have to be keeping an eye on not just trees that could have egg masses, but also annuals and perennials that um, are also host plants. Um, of course, we're still looking for it's the tree that it's mostly associated with, which is Tree of Heaven, also on our invasive plant list. If you um, have come across Tree of Heaven here in the state, we'd really like to know about it. So please report that to us. Um, and last but not least, we wanted to just make you aware that the invasive plant list here in the state of Maine for terrestrial plants is in the process of being updated. Um, the rule asks for it to be updated every five years. And believe it or not, it's been five years. So um, that's something that we're working on. Um, there has been a stakeholder committee that was created last year and they have really gone through a huge list and whittled it down of plants. Uh, it started with about 176 species is the number I believe it started with. Um, we narrowed that down to I think it was around 80 species that we wanted to actually evaluate for their invasive properties based on the criteria that's in the current rule. And um, so we've narrowed that down to I believe it's 63 right now. And those are being considered. We're still, we have another meeting next week to talk about those and make sure everybody's on the same page with adding those. Um, but there's quite a few um, that are being considered this time. So we really are asking people to watch for the proposed rule changes that will be put out um, this year, probably sooner than later. Um, and comment on those if any of these species affect you and your business. Um, there are several that are sold in the nursery trade, um, so we really do need your comments on this, this rule. Um, these are people who are in the stakeholder committee who are talking about it, so um, if you want to talk to anybody about this and your opinions on these, you can contact them at this point. Um, Later on, after we propose all of the species that could potentially go on the list, we will um, we will present that. We'll we'll be putting that out there for everybody, and there'll be a specific time when people can make comments, and we'll have a hearing, um, and so that will be more of an official comment period. Which I think I just said all of this. Yes, but I do just want to mention, you know, some of the species that may be of concern for you on this list are Japanese tree lilac, um, Syringa reticulata, um, Rugosa rose, um, trying to think butterfly bush. So there are some that are commonly in the trade right now that are being evaluated and considered. So we really hope everybody will participate and um, give us comments on this rule when it's proposed. And I'm going to skip this part. I will just say we are trying to make sure people know that um, it's not just, you know, potted plants that are um, prohibited or regulated. Um, bittersweet wreaths or, you know, uh, multiflora rose wreaths. I would never want to make one of those, but it looks like somebody did. Um, those also have propagative parts, you know, there are seeds on there that definitely could um, be moved to a new location. So we're, we were making sure that people weren't selling those this year. Uh, we have been all along, but we had some reports this year. If you want to know more about our invasive plant list, um, you can go to our website, which is main.gov slash hort is the easy way to do it. And then there's an icon for invasive plants um, and you can get more information on those there. And whew, I just breeze through that. How am I doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I went over. You're fine. There was a question in the chat. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
Have there been any reports of increased pesticide resistance in whitefly? Hmm. Um, I haven't heard of anything recently about that, but I know that's been a concern for a while now. And I know that there was maybe five years ago, there was a year where um, whiteflies on poinsettias really seemed to be quite resistant. So um, I haven't heard anything recently. I, I know it's something we're always recommending people rotate any pesticides they're using. Um, but I'm, I don't have any new information, sorry. Okay. 